Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 216th New Social Environment. I'm Emily Dean, a production assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for the 22nd Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Leila Chati. We're also thrilled to have the poets Hala al Yan, Safia El Hilo, Benjamin Garcia, and Dorian Lowe here with us today. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Kanarsi, Munsi, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. The Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAddy, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyan Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country, and acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability, and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our first reader, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce our first reader of the day. Hala al Yan is a Palestinian American writer and clinical psychologist whose work has appeared in The New Yorker, in The New York Times. Sorry, I, um, in Guernica and elsewhere. Her poetry collections have won the Arab American Book Award and the Crab Orchard series. And her second novel, The Arsonist City, will be published by Hoot and Muffling Hardcore in March, 2021. Hala, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanna start by saying thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Thank you for to Brooklyn Rail. Thank you to Leila for reaching out um, and for the other amazing poets that you're going to hear in a few minutes. I am going to read a few poems um, of mine and then a couple of poems by other folks. So, Happy Inauguration Day, whatever that means for you. Self-portrait as my mother. When the warplanes come, I pluck them from the blue sky like Tic Tacs. The cupboard is always full of honey and needles, Merlot and Marlboros, the rumor of America around my neck. On the third day of the month, I bleed a pond, toss a gun into its mouth, I am the gun. The chamber empties into a Feiruz song. Take the color of the trees with you. California is my safe word. Oh bird, oh bird, a oh wink of a car on a highway. I know a nation by its germs, its endangered water. I know the desert as an unborn son and every night I claim him. His black hair spiky as a cactus. Give me a fate and I'll lose it. Give me a border and I'll run it crooked as a love line on a bride's palm. I sing, I mop the floors, I can't kill for enough clean. At the brocantes, I buy mirrors and clocks, lavender seeds, bird feeders fill my house with the belongings of dead white men. My breasts rise, I read the drugstore horoscopes. My moon is in Sagittarius, suns in Akka, heavens in empty sky, borders open, there's nothing on the other side and isn't that God enough? Uh, this is a piece that I wrote a couple of days after the um, August 4th explosion in Beirut. I barely recognize him in the video. His angry face saying there is a bullet for each of their heads. It's that old punchline about brutality, how it turns you brutal, but I remember him tender, one night not kissing me because we had drank too much. 
There are nooses hanging in Martyr's Square, and at night I dream of white men saving me from other white men, and I am ashamed. Where are the martyrs? Where are the men who 15 years ago told me to come home? Said, we don't want you hurt. Said a car bomb had gone off and two died, but they were the two they were aiming for. Who is this smoke aimed for? Who are they doing the aiming? They behind gates. The fortune teller says, open your heart chakra. And I laugh in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Look at the clean buildings and trim trees. Look down at my heart neatly inside my chest, my Apple Watch, my water bottle. I want to fight for a country, even if that country didn't want me. Even if when my mother bought a patch of land and tried to put my name on it, they wouldn't let me. Because my name is my father's name. Because he was born in Palestine and so impossible and so impossible. And so I am fated to love what won't have me, you know, the way our mothers did. So this is a Natalie Diaz poem that I love. Um, and it's called, They Don't Love You Like I Love You. My mother said this to me long before Beyonce lifted the lyrics from the yeah, yeah, yeahs. And what my mother meant by don't stray was that she knew all about it. The way it feels to need someone to love you, someone not your kind, someone white, someone, some many who live because so many of mine have not and further live on top of those of ours who don't. I'll say, 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 I'll say, 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 what is the United States if not a clot of clouds, if not spilled milk or blood, if not the place we once were in the millions? America is maps. Maps are ghosts, white and layered with people and places I see through. My mother has always known best, knew that I'd be begging for them to lay my face against their white laps, to be held in something more than the loud light of their projectors of themselves, they flicker sepia or blue all over my body. All this time, I thought my mother said, wait, as in give them a little more time to know your worth. When really she said, wait, meaning heft, preparing me for the yoke of myself, the beast of my country's burdens, which is less worse than my country's plow. Yes, when my mother said, they don't love you like I love you, she meant, Natalie, that doesn't mean you aren't good. And I wanted to read a poem by Ada Limon called A New National Anthem. The truth, the truth is, I've never cared for the national anthem. If you think about it, it's not a good song. Too high for most of us with the rocket's red glare, and then there are the bombs. Always, always, there is war and bombs. Once, I sang it at homecoming and threw even the tenacious high school band off key. But the song didn't mean anything. Just a call to the field, something to get through before the pummeling of youth, and what of the stanzas we never sing? The third that mentions, mentions no refuge could save the hireling and the slave. Perhaps the truth is every song of this country has an unsung third stanza, something brutal snaking underneath us as we blindly sing the high notes with a beer sloshing in the stands, hoping our team wins. Don't get me wrong. I do like the flag, how it undulates in the wind like water elemental and best when it's humble, brought to its knees, clung to by someone who has lost everything. When it's not a weapon, when it flickers, when it folds up so perfectly, you can keep it until it's needed, until you can love it again, until the song in your mouth feels like sustenance, a song where the notes are sung by even the ageless woods, the short grass plains, the red river gorge, the fistful of land left unpoisoned, that song that's our birthright, that's sung in silence when it's too hard to go on, that sounds like someone's rough fingers weaving into another's, that sounds like a match being lit in an endless cave, that song that says my bones are your bones and your bones are my bones and isn't that enough. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. This is one of mine. Um, and 
That's it. Thank you again for having me. When they say pledge allegiance, I say, my country is a ghost, a mouth trying to say sorry and it comes out all smoke, all citizen and bullet and seed. My country is a machine, a spell of bad weather, a feather lacing my mother's black hair. I mean her dyed hair, I mean her blonde hair, I mean her hair matches my country, so shiny and borrowed and painted over. My country is a number, like, it is 1948 and my great-great-grandmother flattens bread with her hands while my other great-great-grandmother prays with her hands. One watches her land disappear. The other builds a house on land that will disappear. My country is an airport line, a year of highways and intermission. My country is Stockholm syndrome, is immigrant mouth saying thank you, saying please, saying my country is no country but ghost, is no man but ghost. My country is dead. My country is name the dead, is give them their letters, give them their salt. My country is a mouth trying to say pledge and it comes out all salt. My country is a mouth and nobody can pronounce my name. I mean, my country forgets my name. I mean, my country is always asking for my name and I'm always saying it twice, spelling it like an address. My country is a number like it is 1967 and every Arab leader is crying. Every mother is clutching the son she has left and my great grandmother names my mother nostalgia while my great grandfather names my father a gun. My country is all ghost. My grandmother is all ghost. My grandmother is a country. I mean, my grandmother is my country. I mean, my country is a lie, is an empty house, is 1,000 1, cardboard boxes. My country is, remember when we left Akta? I mean, Gaza, I mean, Homs. My country is a number, like it is 1990. My mother is crossing a border, I mean desert, I mean life, I am at her heels. I'm paying attention. I mean, I'm learning to pray to a flag. I mean, I'm learning English. I mean, I'm forgetting Arabic or it is 1994 and I am falling in love with a white boy, a habit I will never kick. Or it is 2004 and my grandparents won't evacuate, won't leave another war and all summer I dream of floods, collect bullets and love the wrong person or it is 2003 and I am in Beirut watching Baghdad burn because of America. I mean, I am in my country watching my country burn because of my country or it is 2016 and some saw it coming or it is 2020 and the women in Beirut are a sea. I mean, my country looks beautiful and red. I mean, I look beautiful and red. I mean, this country likes me in red or it is every year and my country is taken. My country is stolen land. I mean, all my countries are stolen land. I mean, sometimes I am on the wrong side of the stealing. My country is an opening. I mean, bloom. I mean, bloom not like flower, but bloom like explosion. My country is a teacher. I mean, do you want to see my passport? I mean, do you like my accent? I mean, I stole them. I mean, I stole them. I mean, where do you think I learned that from? Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hala. That was so amazing. Um, next, we will hear from our curator today. Leila Chati is a Tunisian American poet and author of Deluge, Copper Canyon Press 2020, and the chat books Ebb, Akashic Books 2018 and Tunisia Amrikia, the 2017 editor selection from Bull City Press. Her honors include a Pushcart Prize, grants from the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund and the Helene Wurlitzer Foundation, and fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, and Cleveland State University, where she was the inaugural Ainsfield Wolf Fellow in Publishing and Writing. She currently teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she is the Mendota Lecturer in Poetry. And Layla, over to you. Thank you. Oh my, I'm like stunned right now a little bit. Um, that was an amazing reading. This is, this is everything that I want to be doing today. Um, thank you for joining me, friends, um, and new friends who are watching. Um, this is wonderful. And thank you, Brooklyn Royal, for, for giving us the space uh, to do this family reading. I feel like this is family. 
Um, I'm going to start out with reading um, a couple of poems that I think of as, as more um, maybe overtly political, um, and then transition this work that I think is the, my more quieter, quieter political work. Um, when I was starting out, I felt a lot of pressure um, to write Arab poems, um, sometimes explicitly sort of said to me in that way. And I was really confused about what that would mean. Um, and I wanted to write poems that I, that I was speaking um, as a singular person. Um, and to do that, uh, it was like the more narrow version or scope of what I know, which is to be Tunisian, which is something that's very different um, than all the other things that one might be um, and specific. And I wanted to write um, from a specific experience, not from a general sort of mythology of a, of a person. Um, so these poems are two that engage specifically with being Tunisian um, and not just sort of a, a constructed stock Arab, I guess. Um, so that's why I wanted to read these two. And the first one that I'm going to read um, is tea. Five times a day, I make tea. I do this because I like the warmth in my hands, like the feeling of self-directed kindness. I'm not used to it, warmth and kindness, both. So I create my own when I can. It's easy. You just pour water into a kettle and turn the knob and listen for the scream. I do this five times a day. Sometimes when I'm pleased, I let out a little sound. A poet noticed this and it made me feel I might one day properly be loved. Because no one is here to love me, I make tea for myself and leave the radio playing. I must remind myself I am here and do so by noticing myself. My feet are cold inside my socks. They touch the ground. My stomach churns. My heart stutters. In my hands, I hold a warmth I make. I come from a people who pray five times a day and make tea. I admire the way they do both how they drop to the ground wherever they are, drop pine nuts and mint sprigs in a glass. I think to care for the self is a kind of prayer. It is a gesture of devotion toward what is not always beloved or believed. I do not always believe in myself or love myself. I am sure there are times I am bad or gone or lying. In another's mouth, tea often means gossip, but sometimes means truth. Despite the trope in my experience, my people do not lie for pleasure or when they should, even when it might be a gesture of kindness, but they are kind. If you were to visit, a woman would bring you a tray of tea at any time of day. My people love tea so much it was once considered a sickness. Their colonizers tried, as with any joy, to snuff it out. They feared a love so strong one might sell or kill their other loves for leaves and sugar. Teaism sounds like a kind of faith I'd buy into, a god I wouldn't fear. I think now I truly believe I wouldn't kill anyone for love, not even myself. Most days, I can barely get out of bed, so I make tea. I stand at the window while I wait. My feet are cold and the radio plays its little sounds. I do the small thing I know how to do to care for myself. I'm trying to notice joy, which means survive. I do this all day and then the next. Um, and this next poem, um, yeah, I, I'll just read it. Um, thinking a lot about sort of um, hatred and division and also how it appears on the internet, which is um, increasingly right now how I'm experiencing it, being in isolation. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's prevalent all the time. But this poem is titled, In response to the capsized boat and 65 people drowned off the Tunisian coast, a flood of white Americans and Europeans on Twitter write who cares and thank you and good 
and I tell my father. Maybe it's strange, he says, but it reminds him of hunting. Those Michigan shows that appear if you leave the television on long enough in an empty room, wandering in just as a sky eyed to Ashley or Joe with a gun slung over a camouflage shoulder says something about love. My father says it always goes like this. Someone insisting it's love they feel for what they kill as they kill it. He means for some, there's a distance, even in love, which allows for violence delights in it. In their bios, many of the commenters describe themselves as loving husband and father, as proud Christian, and I still love the world enough to be surprised by this. At a distance, I assume others are kind, and this seems an essential difference. Distance, in its original usage, referred to conflict, not space. As in, America prides itself in maintaining conflict between itself and everyone else. One of the most illustrious films about love and distance involves a boat which sinks. Because its occupants are European emigrating to the United States, this is considered a tragedy as well as romantic. The term migrant is used intentionally by the commenters to place linguistic distance between people and that they are. They seem to take pleasure in the repeated erasure. To illustrate the difference between the related terms, a dictionary states the Arab migrates, the European coming to America is an emigrant to those whom he leaves and an immigrant to the Americans. In this instance, the people drowned are not all Arab, but they are all not white. And this what incites the language, the distance. The original meaning of emigration is removal from a place. The sea is a place of removal, a country which shares its border with death. When asked to remind, to identify on a map Middle Eastern countries, one third of Americans could, though over half support the drone strikes in them. One study found the less Americans knew about a country's location, the more they wanted military intervention. The commenters say they want to know what violence the drowned were supposedly freeing, fleeing from because violence is the requisite, though no amount of violence would be enough. If they are in a boat, they deserve it. If they are in a country, they deserve it. I am disgusted, and yet it is these commenters I give my attention, attention, a form of love. All morning I do it. Intervention at once meant intercession, a prayer on behalf of another. I say to my father, do you think they feel a little love for us? I write the wrong poem. I feel the dead. I feel the dead. Um, okay, and I want to read one from the chapbook, Tensia Merkia, which is the first poem called Muslim Girlhood. I never found myself in any pink aisle. There was no box for me with glossy cellophane-like heat and a neat packet of instructions in six languages. Evenings, I watched TV like a religion I moderately believed. I watched to see how the others lived, not knowing I was the other, no laugh track in my living room, no tidy and punctual, Resolution waiting. I took tests in which Jane and William had so many apples, but never a friend named Khadija. I fasted through birthday parties and Christmas parties and ate leftover tagine at plastic lunch tables, picked a pepperoni from slices like blemishes, and tried not to complain. I prayed at the wrong times in the wrong tongue. I hungered for jello and starburst and margarine, could read mono and diglycerides by five, and knew what gelatin meant, where it came from. When I asked for anything good, like Cedar Point or slumber parties, I offered a quick inshallah, as in, can Jordan sleep over this weekend, inshallah? Peeking at my father, as if he were a god. Sometimes I thought my father was a god. I loved him that much. 
and the news thought this was an impossible thing. A Muslim girl who loved her father. But what did they know of my heart? Or my father who drove 50 miles to buy me a doll like a Barbie because it looked like me. Short brown hair underneath her hijab on threatening breasts and feet flat enough to carry her as far as she wanted to go. In my games, she traveled and didn't marry, devoured any book she could curl her small, rigid fingers around. I called her Amira because it was a name like my sister's, though I think her name was supposed to be Sara, that drawled A so like sorry, which she never, ever was. I think I'm just going to read just a few from um, my book, Dayesh. I'm going to start out with the first poem, Confession. And there's an epigraph um, from when Mary is giving birth to Jesus in the Quran. She says, Oh, I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion, forgotten. Truth be told, I like Mary a little better when I imagine her like this, crouched and cursing, a boy god pushing on her cervix. I like remembering she had a cervix her body ordinary and so like mine. Girl sweat lacing rivulets like veins in the sand. Her small hands on her knees, not doves, but hands gripping, a palm pressed to her spine, bronze whispering like voyeurs overhead. Oh, Mary, like a god, I too take pleasure in knowing you were not all holy, that ache could undo you like a knot. And suffering, I admire this girl who cared for a moment not about God or his plans, but her own distinct life. This fiercer Mary who'd disappear if it saved her, who'd howl to hell with salvation if it meant this pain. The blessed adolescent who squatted indignant in a desert, bearing his child like a secret she never wanted to hear. I think I'm just going to read two more. Hymen. Second blood, I never knew you. After the first, scoured the bed for your blazoned blot and came up empty. Perhaps I was born without you. A box with no prize inside, a Sunday with no cherry on top. God of good girls, God of matrimony, mother state, which I consider a distant country with a discordant tongue. Did you speak with God and conclude I hadn't use for you? Once I was small as your kin, so small and for such a long time, longer than I've lived, I fit inside my mother when she fit inside her mother and so on and so forth and further a nest of matrons, knees, and a beam, in which to be female is to be something like infinity. And was it determined then what kind of woman I would be? It seems I've always been frightened. Little veil of wedlock's lock, clicking shut. The heritable procession of women whispering in the aisle of my pulse. Don't do, don't do, don't. And I haven't done this, the grave amen, the grave I've dug with the spade of pleasure. But wanting seal of want, I did want it, did choose to commit my life's greatest transgression with a benevolent accomplice. And so in the here before, you could say I'm among the spared. What a mess this messlessness of you could have been in any number of lives my size billowing specters of dresses on a line of possibility, lives in which I am the bridesmaid and you maidenhead, the bride given away, where I am the acquired property and you the red ribbon severed in the threshold, I the purse and you the coin tendered. Perhaps no one ever told you, precious emblem of innocence, simulacrum for honor, that some believe you the most important part of me, vital, like a heart a man gets the thrill of bursting where he can see it, that blood is owed to him. And that's the heart of it, isn't it? Of a woman 
you, the only blood, worth anything. And I'm going to end on a happy one, I think. <laughs> um, this one's called Zena. Verily, it was heaven. I couldn't be certain you would allow me admission, so I sought my own in the body of a man. Verily, I mistook him for you, my lord. I invoked another God, I invoked an other. Before him I prostrated, I proffered myself an oblation, and pleasure coursed through me, angels or exaltation aroused from sleep. And each part named knew itself and bucked and stamped its feet in praise. And the beast I was, was glad. Verily, a woman, the first night of nights, I required a man's flesh to come alive. Everywhere his mouth grazed, I was afflated. And each time he touched me, he touched me as though making me anew with his own two merciful hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Layla. That was so amazing. Next, we will hear from Safia El Hello. Safia El Hello is the author of The January Children, University of Nebraska Press 2017, Girls That Never Die, forthcoming from One World Random House, and the novel in verse, Home Is Not a Country, Make Me a World Random House 2021. She is a, Wag a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and lives in Oakland. Safia, over to you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Leila, for inviting me to be part of this dream lineup. Um, I would love to start by reading an Araceli Skirmai poem that I <clears throat> love and am obsessed with. Um, so I would like to bring this as an offering into the space. Um, this poem is called You Are Who I Love by Araceli Skirmai. You selling roses out of a silver grocery cart. You in the park feeding the pigeons. You cheering for the bees. You with cats in your voice in the morning feeding cats. You protecting the river. You are who I love, delivering babies, nursing the sick. You with henna on your feet and a gold star in your nose. You taking your medicine, reading the magazines. You looking into the faces of young people as they pass, smiling and saying, all right, which they know it means, I see you, family, I love you, keep on. You dancing in the kitchen, on the sidewalk, in the subway, waiting for the train because Stevie Wonder, Hector Laveau, La Lupe. You stirring the pot of beans, you washing your father's feet, you are who I love. You reciting Darwish, then June, feeding your heart, teaching your parents how to do the Dougie, counting to 10, reading your patient's charts, you are who I love, changing policies, standing in line for water, stocking the food pantries, making a meal. You are who I love, writing letters, calling the senators. You who, with the seconds of your body, with your time here, arrive on buses, on trains, in cars, by foot, to stand in the January streets against the cool and brutal offices, saying, your cruelty does not speak for me. You are who I love. You struggling to see, you struggling to love or find a question, you better than me, you kinder and so blistering with anger, you are who I love, standing in the wind, salvaging the umbrellas, graduating from school, wearing holes in your shoes, you are who I love, weeping or touching the faces of the weeping, you, Violetta Parra, grateful for the alphabet, for sound, singing toward us in the dream, you carrying your brother home, you noticing the butterflies, sharing your water, sharing your potatoes and greens. You who did and did not survive. You who cleaned the kitchens. 
you who built the railroad tracks and roads, you who replanted the trees, listening to the work of squirrels and birds, you are who I love, you whose blood was taken, whose hands and lives were taken, with or without your saying, yes, I mean to give, you are who I love, you who the borders crossed, you whose fires, you decent with rage, so in love with the earth, you writing poems alongside children, you cactus, water, sparrow, crow, you my elder, you are who I love, summoning the courage, making the cobbler, getting the blood drawn, sharing the difficult news, you always planting the marigolds, learning to walk wherever you are, learning to read wherever you are, you baking the bread, you come to me in dreams, you kissing the faces of your dead wherever you are, speaking to your children in your mother's languages, tootsing the birds, you are who I love, behind the library desk, leaving who might kill you, crying with the love songs, polishing your shoes, lighting the candles, getting through the first day despite the whisperers sniping fail, fail, fail. You are who I love, you who beat and did not beat the odds, you who knows that any good thing you have is the result of someone else's sacrifice, work, you who fights for reparations, you are who I love, you who stands at the courthouse with the sign that reads, no justice, no peace. You are who I love, singing Leonard Cohen to the snow. You with glitter on your face, wearing a kilt and violet lipstick. You are who I love, sighing in your sleep. You playing drums in the procession. You feeding the chickens and humming as you hem the skirt. You sharpening the pencil. You writing the poem about the loneliness of the astronaut. You wanting to listen. You trying to be so still. You are who I love, mothering the dogs, standing with horses. You in brightness and in darkness, throwing your head back as you laugh, kissing your hand. You carrying the berbere from the mill and the jug of oil pressed from the olives of the trees you belong to. You studying stars. You are who I love, braiding your child's hair. You are who I love, crossing the desert and trying to cross the desert. You are who I love, working the shifts to buy books, rice, tomatoes, bathing your children as you listen to the lecture, heating the kitchen with the oven, up early, up late. You are who I love, learning English, learning Spanish, drawing flowers on your hand with a ballpoint pen, taking the bus home. You are who I love, speaking plainly about your pain, sucking your teeth at the airport terminal television every time the politicians say something that offends your sense of decency, of thought, which is often. You are who I love, throwing your hands up in agony or disbelief, shaking your head, arguing back, out loud or inside of yourself, holding close your incredulity, which yes, too, I love. I love your working heart, how each of its gestures, tiny or big, stand beside my own agony, building a forest there, how fuck you becomes a love song. You are who I love, carrying the signs, packing the lunches with the rain on your face, you at the edges and shores, in the rooms of quiet, in the rooms of shouting, in the airport terminal, at the bus depot saying no, and each of us looking out from the gorgeous unlikelihood of our lives at all, finding ourselves here, witnesses to each other's tenderness, which this moment is fury, is rage, which this moment is another way of saying, you are who I love, you are who I love, you and you and you are who. Um, it seems almost wild for me to read any poem after that poem. Um, but uh, here are um, some poems that I wrote. Um, this first poem is called From My Friends in Reply to a Question. I'm okay. And of course, I'm not. But I go through the motions. I wake up to the alarms howl, even when the word in my body is no. I dress in livid colors. I blacken the hairs of each eyebrow. I bake and braise and pickle. I write and read and lose hours to the blur of the television. I sit for hours in the bath, my skin puckering. I don't know if I'll ever go home again. I don't know who I've seen for the last time. The Arabic comes back to me in streaks of paint, verb forms and vocabularies I may never again have occasion to use. My days smudge into one another and it's not that I am afraid. It's as if I am watching it all happen below and I'm somewhere above the room, wondering if the rice is burning. 
I am somewhere above the room, watching my new aches, watching the news as if I am reading it in a novel. I look up the names of people I knew in childhood, learn their new and angular faces, their faraway lives. My grandfather pixelates into a smile and I work my creaking muscles to replicate it. I do not ask if we will ever meet again. I do not ask him to read to me or for anything that will make me long. I dull it with sugar and oil, with cooking shows, with sleep. I sleep 12 hours each night and in my dreams I am fleeing a war. In my dreams I am touching the faces of my friends. We are each one of us touching and even in the dream we are afraid. Uh, this is called Modern Sudanese Poetry. My husband works his fingers into the knot muscled against my spine and my dead stay dead. My hair a knotted cursive language, my ligature, my grief barely literate, my amulets knotted around my neck and wrists, my language, my language, cursive and silent, glottal and knotted and scarring the cheeks of my dead, adorning the hair of my dead, tallow in their braided hair. I read the books in translation, where is the poem, and circle every word I know, acacia, lupin, sandalwood and ash, they ululate my dead. They squat like brides over clay pots of smoke, a yoke suspended in each open eye. And some in truth are not dead, my dead, and I am who is lost, who is not counted among the living. The poem is not owed me. I was wed in all the colors of my dead, the reddening, the borrowed gold. I wrote the poem in translation. I wrote the poem in the loophole. I wrote the poem in cursive. I snarled it. I picked apart the threads and wove a shroud. I was wed in it. I unfastened. I broke my fast with apricots, furred like the ears of my dead. I looked laterally for ancestors. I descended left and right. I read the book in Arabic, knew each letter and its sound, and did not recognize the words for tallow, for ululate, my dead, my languages, my ligatures, smoke in my loosened hair. Um, this poem is called Ani's Length. Though to a child of fleeing people, my husband has never held his name and body at arm's length at an airport. We looked at maps, taking turns with the middle seat, summered in old cities, held hands at the airport. In that famous city of romance, we folded in with the other immigrants, spiced food and blue smoke, shisha a perfume in the air. Portmanteau is a game we played in transit, the mischief found in Christopher. I left loving that old city, even when I was searched at the airport. When we were first married, he would dream of all the places we might live, security arriving again after I'd boarded to remove me from the airplane for a third search, my clothes scattered around the jet bridge, shame swelling in my throat. It's a joke by now, the Muslim at the airport. All the places we might live, healthcare in a metro, do we speak the language, cost of renting an apartment, its proximity to an airport, twice already pregnant, my mother on a long ago flight, turbulence and nausea in return for passports for her children, our ease in every airport, while she stayed behind to be searched, headscarf and the wrong papers, my brother and I American and killing time, eating fast food at the airport. After that election, after each new video where we die, we consider our ancestral work of leaving, bored of destinations like a menu at the airport. He has his heart set on it, that city, my husband, it's long afternoon, sunset two hours before midnight, and I can't. It was one time, but still, the airport. They hate Muslims in that country, I eventually say. My exalted passport, just paper, ugly shade of blue, and everywhere in the world. The airport, the place where it is most plainly said, but not the only. So where is there for us to go, for me and mine? Name I cannot help and cannot hide what it reports. And now it feels so far away, that place, that portal. I surprise myself by longing. The world, everyone, everything I love, kept from me on the other side of an airport. And then uh, I'm gonna read one more short poem. And what is a country but the drawing of a line? Today I draw thick black lines around my eyes and they are a country. 
and thick red lines around my lips and they are a country. And the knife that chops the onions draws a smooth line through my finger and that is a country. And the tightening denim presses a soft purple line into my belly. And when I smile like my mother, a line flashes between my two front teeth. And for every country I lose, I make another and I make another. Thank you, Safia. That was incredible. Next, we will hear from Benjamin Garcia, Benjamin Garcia's first collection, Thrown in the Throat from Milkweed Editions, was selected by Kazim Ali for the 2019 National Poetry Series. He works as a sexual health and harm reduction educator in New York's Finger Lakes region, a Canto Mundo and Lambda Literary Fellow, he serves as faculty at Alma College's Low Residency MFA program. His poems and essays have recently appeared or are forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Best New Poets 2020, Kenyon Review, and the New England Review. Benjamin, I'm passing you the mic. Hi there. So um, thanks for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, these readings have really been amazing. So um, usually I'm really nervous before doing a reading, but this time I can actually just like relax and listen and it was amazing, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start off uh, by acknowledging that um, we have a new president today and that comes with a lot of, you know, mixed feelings of joy and, um, well, I'm gonna share some, these two poems that I think, um, oh, I'm not able to share those poems. I don't know why I can't share a screen. Um, that's okay, so I'll just read these two. So the first one is um, one that's actually really, really well known um, and I'm reading it because it's something I appreciate, but just because I pre appreciate it doesn't mean that it's complete or perfect. And so this first poem is Good Bones by Maggie Smith. So life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious ill-advised ways. A thousand delicious ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there's a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is at least one who would break you. Though I keep this from my children, I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent like, realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. And this other poem that I wanted to bring in is by Natalie Center Zapico, which is in conversation with Maggie Smith's poem. And I guess I wanted to bring these two in because I, I hold both of these poems in the same way that, you know, I hold this country in a lot of ways where I can appreciate the good, but that doesn't mean that I don't uh, critique or have um, things that we could continue to work on. So, buen esqueleto. Life is short and I tell this to mis hijas. Life is short and I tell them how to talk to police without opening the door, how to leave the social security number blank on the exam. I tell this to mis hijas. The world tells them I hate you every day and I don't keep this from mis hijas because of the bus driver who kicks them out onto the street for fare evasion. Because I love mis hijas, I keep them from men who knock their heads together just to hear the chime. Life is short and the world is terrible. I know no kind strangers in this country who aren't sisters a desert away, and I don't keep this from mis hijas. It's not my job to sell them the world, but to keep them safe in case I get deported. Our first landlord said this, or said with a bucket of bleach, the mold would come right off. 
He shook mis hijas, said they had good bones for hard work. Mis hijas could make this place beautiful. I tried to make this place beautiful. Um, and so I'm gonna try to uh, share the screen one more time, but um, okay, there we go. So this uh, poem sort of um, works to introduce my book, Thrown in the Throat, which um, deals a lot with language and um, sort of what can be allowed in poetry and what isn't. And so I'm just gonna read these poems through. So the language in question, he has a mouth on him. Yes, bitch, but allow me this amendment. I've had several mouths on me, sometimes simultaneously, but let's not go there now. Suffice it to say, God gave me two ears and one mouth for reasons I've been unconvinced by. God damn, my mouth has many uses. Eat, sing, bite, kiss, most of all, insinuate. Have you ever been sucked by the cups of an octopus's underside? It's a daily special I highly recommend to the critics who might say some words don't belong in poems. Just because you won't twirl the legs of a live octopus due to texture or fear of asphyxiation doesn't mean it won't taste good. Taste is what the octopus does on its way down with its tentacles. The language in question is like that. It's a squishy worm-like squirm can contort and go down the wrong pipe. If some words don't belong in poems, then I say some people can go fuck themselves. Just kidding. I don't really say that because they might actually enjoy it if they could only let themselves relax. Here's a word I never thought I'd have occasion to use in a poem. Poppers, one whiff and even a novice no vice could let the sphincter open just long enough for this octopus to pass. Uvula, violet, vulva. Eye of the Hurricane. Garcia is my common name, but you can call me by my suborder, vermilingua, because my tongue worms into pockets. Quieres ver mi lengua? If you want to keep America, America, better bolt it down or lock it. Ay vamos. An anteater isn't afraid of a cage, won't hesitate to smite, transformed its tropical depression to a migration of wrath, machetes down its own path, though it contains in its craw a rainbow, un arco if you choose, you can crawl away from this. If you brunt the gridlock and contraflow on I-45 North along the evacuation route, there is an out, though disaster is never complete. Without you, the domestic animal left inside, the house might still survive. Though you are embarrassed by something smaller than a crushed ant, the shit stains of cockroaches pocking the spine of your English text, the edges of your spiral notebooks. A tongue isn't worth very much, but there is enough for everyone. Remember, there is no cage. You cannot leave the joke. Why do Mexicans wear pointy boots? To get the roaches in the corners. We all had German, American, whatever kind of cockroach shitting on our books and our alarm clocks telling us to go the fuck to school, where with difficulty I learned in drills to kneel in single file along hard and polished halls where the floor confronts the wall, then cover my ears as the storm roared above. My class was promised a piece of hard candy to complete this analogy. Tire is to hubcap as hurricane is to blank. You keep those grades up. One day you're going to make so much money. So why do Mexicans wear pointy boots? I didn't delouse my tongue because even then I knew nothing comes quickly but disaster. I would have to make myself fat on what others might be made sick by. But where is your family really from? What's your native tongue? I ate it. Um, I just noticed that even in this document, um, my last name is, uh, it's telling me my last name is misspelled. <laughs> so <laughs> just really, um... for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over uh, one of those poems and um, I'll read two and then that'll be it. So this is um, 
gay epithalamium. Girls, never ask your gay best friend when they're getting married. Never call your gay best friend your gay best friend. Boys and girls, never ask your gay friends who is the woman and who is the man, because that's the whole point. We may act like a lady, but we don't care for the lady parts. Boys, if you mean to ask who is the bottom and who is the top, I hope you know that asking this demonstrates interest in being one of the two. One of the two, boys and girls, listen to me, still breaking up with old black and white habits. When you mail your acceptance, please check if you prefer the beef or fish. In English, beef can also mean to have a problem with. In Spanish, a fish can be called he who dies by the mouth. When I have a problem, I spit it out. Chicken isn't a menu option. My mouth has gotten my teeth knocked out before. Can you guess which? Don't assume I will get married, but love is love. My tongue is in my cheek again, because where else would it be? Love is love, you say, as if the heart were a palindrome. Friends, don't pretend orientation doesn't matter. Or do these two sound the same to you? This cake is to die for. Is this the cake I died for? No, I don't care if a calla lily isn't a true lily. I would still include it in my bouquet. I would still stick it in your centerpiece. You want to know why I haven't gotten married? There aren't enough kinds of lilies. Tiger, Kala, Easter, Asiatic, of the valley. Or maybe I don't think a Mary should get married, anchored to the past. Or maybe because my partner can officiate a wedding in, for his friends in 50 states, but a baker can still refuse to make our cake. It's an old habit I still can't break, thinking about getting gay married to my gay best friend, praying to my gay god, having dinner with my gay family, using my gay hand to spoon gay cake into my cake mouth. There aren't enough words for being gay, fairy, pansy, sissy, and even cake, but also confirmed bachelor, friend of Dorothy, family. Why do you smash cake into your spouse's face on your wedding day? You don't have to answer because my tongue is in my cheek again. Where else could it go? I'm asking for a friend. And so I'm just gonna close out with um, this poem. So, uh, Ode to the Corpse Flower. In the language of flowers, I am the one who says, fuck you, I won't be anyone's nose gay. This Mary is her own talking bouquet. Never let a man speak for you or call you what he wants. I learned that the hard way. Amorphophallus titanum. It sure sounds pretty in a dead tongue, except it's Latin for big ugly dick. I mean, I am, but what an asshole scientist. I prefer to think of myself, and this may sound vain, as a goddess, cadaver dressed in drag, my stage name, Versace Medusa, part Lilith, part Calla Lily. Keep your heteronormative birds and bees. Give me the necrophiliacs, the freaks, the meat-eating beetle and flesh fly. There I go again, allies, getting all hot and bothered being vulgar. Vulgar meaning common, as when something is below you, like a girl forbidden to say fuck. It makes a woman sound so common. Oh, come on. That's all you expect from a flower, to be likable. But to keep it raw and 100 is to be abhorred. Fine. But even the haters will pay to hold their nose at a halftime show. They'll claim they are beyond Beyonce, sick of Selena, yet they can't look away from the live cam. No one wants to miss the showgirl as she breaks through the cake, unhooks her lingerie, La Virgen de Guadalupe, with a twist of Santa Muerte. What in the hell is she wearing? Glad you ask. Death is the new Christian Dior. The latest Chanel is corpse smell. I am the weak old ham hock whore of horticulture. I bring the hothouse hot couture and I always come in last place. Dressed to the nines, I get what I want, which is to be the tenth muse. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, little Levita de Buenos Aires, screwing and screwing over los descamisados on my rainbow tour. Fuck Whitman, fuck Pound, give me Emily D. Speaking of which, have I ever told you, Daddy, only sun gods get me hard. You want it, I got it. Let me show you how a chola really leans. Mother nature may wear floral, but I ain't your mama. 
I thirst like Betty Boop at Pete Coquette, Marilyn Monroe blowing in an air vent, say Malinche, say Truvada whore, give me more, I thrive in shade, my throat is my throne, so queen me, bitch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. That was amazing. Uh, our last but not least poet is Dorian Lowe. Dorian Lowe's sixth collection, Only As The Day Is Long, New and Selected Poems, was named a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Her fifth collection, The Books of Men, was awarded the, Pat the Patterson Prize. Her fourth book of poems, Facts About the Moon, won the Oregon Book Award and was shortlisted for the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. Lowe is also the author of Awake, What We Carry, a finalist for the National Book Critics' Choice Award, Smoke, as well as Fine Small Press Edition, The Book of Women. And Dorianne, I'm passing it to you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Layla, for putting this incredible reading together. I mean, we've just been blessed, you know. Um, I thought I'd start with a poem that I wrote um, when I was at North Carolina State, which is where I met Layla. And um, I, I sent it to her as a kind of welcome, you know, and uh, so I'll read it here now. It's called Autumn Prayer, North Carolina State. When I walk to my car, I see him kneeling on a square of dirt beneath a tree, his forehead pressed against a patch of yellow grass. I know he's praying, so I walk lightly, respectfully, my head down so he won't think I'm looking at him. Maybe he's 23, thin and kempt, his black jeans and white shirt clean, pressed. Cars roll by, students chat into cell phones. No one seems to notice there's a young man praying. When I get home, I look up Muslim prayer times on the Islamic finder. Late afternoon, a sur, immediately after the last limit of to her until sunset. He must do this all day, no matter where he is, search for a spot of earth between classes, before work, after work, like this one, maybe three square feet beneath the young crepe myrtle, native, to the Indian subcontinent, third largest Muslim nation, with bark that changes color and produces flowers of many different hues, from deep purple to red to white, with every shade between. Member of the Loose Strife family, blessed with simple, ovoid, lustrous, thin-veined leaves, which release an aromatic odor when bruised and sets free in autumn a thousand small winged seeds. And this is an old poem um, from an old book, but it seems like uh, I could read a poem today about democracy. This is called Democracy. When you're cold, November, the streets icy and everyone you pass homeless. Goodwill coats and hefty bags torn up to make ponchos. Someone is always at the payphone, hunched over the receiver, spewing winter's germs. Swollen lipped, face chapped, making the last tired connection of the day. You keep walking to keep the cold at bay. Too cold to wait for the bus too depressing the thought of entering that blue light, the chilled eyes watching you decide which seat to take, the man with one leg, his crutches bumping the smudged window glass, the woman with a purse clutched to her breasts like a dead child, the boy, pimpled, morose, his head shorn, a swastika carved into the stubble, staring you down. So you walk into the cold you know, the wind, indifferent blade, familiar, the gold leaves heaped along the gutters. You have a home, a house with gas heat, a toilet that flushes, 
You have a credit card, cash. You could take a taxi if one would show up. You can feel it now, why people become Republicans. Get that dog off the street, remove that spit and graffiti, arrest those people huddled on the steps of the church. If it weren't for them, you could believe in God, in freedom. The bus would appear and open its doors, the driver dressed in his tan uniform, pants legs creased, dapper hat, hello miss, watch your step now. But you're not a Republican. You're only tired, hungry, you want out of the cold. So you give up, walk back, step into line behind the grubby vet who hides a bag of wine under his pea coat, holds out his grimy 85 cents, takes each step slow as he pleases, releases his coins into the box and waits as they chink down the chute, stakes out a seat in the back and eases his body into the stained vinyl to dream as the chips of shrapnel in his knee warm up and his good leg flops into the aisle. And you'll doze off too in a while, next to the girl who can't sit still, who listens to her Walkman and taps her boots to a rhythm you can't hear, but you can see it when she bops her head and her hands do a jive in the air. You can feel it as the bus rolls on stopping at each red light in a long wheeze, jerking and idling, rumbling up and lurching off again. So that's us motley Americans. And uh, this final poem is, uh, is called The Ravens of Denali. And I wrote it as we were driving up to Alaska to do a reading with uh, Sharon Olds. And, um, and uh, or actually it was on the way back after we'd done a reading with Sharon Olds. And Joe, the whole time, my husband kept telling me all this kind of wonderful research he'd been doing about ravens. And, uh, and then I wrote this poem because he gave me so many wonderful uh, facts. And, and he complained to Sharon. He said, you know, I mean, I, I do all the footwork, you know, and then my wife writes the poem. It just does not seem fair. And Sharon said, well, Joe, that's like leaving a piece of raw meat on the front porch when you know there's a wolf prowling the neighborhood, you know, and so he shut up after but um, this is called The Ravens of Denali and there's an epigraph from Adam Duretz. And it's, uh, when I think of heaven, deliver me in a black winged bird. Such dumb luck to stumble across an unkindness of ravens at play with a shred of clear visqueen fallen from the blown out window of the Denali truck stop and cafe. Black wings gathering in the deserted parking lot below the assembly of God. Ravens at play in the desolate fields of the Lord. Under the tallest mountain in North America. Eight of them, not as many as, eight of them, as many as the stars in the Big Dipper on Alaska's state flag. Yellow stars sewn to a blue background, flapping from a pole over the roadside. Flag that Benny Benson, age 13, an Alateek Indian of Seward, formerly housed at the Jesse Lee Memorial Home for Orphans in Unalaska, designed and submitted to a contest in 1927 and won his crayoned masterpiece snapping above every broken down courthouse, chipped brick library, and death trap post office in the penultimate state accepted to the Union, known to its people as the Upper One. Though a design of the Northern Lights would have been my choice, those alien green curtains swirling over Mount McKinley, Denali, the Tall One, during the coldest, darkest months of the subarctic year. Red starburst or purple edged skirt rolling in vitreous waves over the stunted ice rime treetops or in spring 
candles of fireweed and the tiny ice blue flowers of the tundra. Tundra, a word that sounds like a thousand caribou pouring down a gorge. But all that might be difficult for an orphan seventh grader to draw with three chewed up crayons and a piece of butcher paper, as would these eight giggling ravens with their shrewd eyes and silt shine wings, beaks like keloid scars, acrobats of speed and sheen, black boot of the bird family. Unconcerned this moment with survival, though I hope they survive, whatever we have in store for them. And the grizzly bear and the club-footed moose, the muscular salmon, the oil spill seal and gull, and Raven's cousin, the bald eagle, who can dive at 100 miles per hour, can actually swim with massive butterfly strokes through the great great glacial lakes of Alaska her wingspan as long as a man. Architect of the two-ton nest, assembled over 34 years with scavenged branches, threatened in all but three of the lower 48, but making by God a comeback if it's not too late for such lofty promises. Even the homely marmot and the immigrant starling, I wish you luck. Whatever ultimate harm we do to this northernmost upflung arm of our country, our revolving world. But you, Epicurean Raven, may you be the pole star of the apocalypse, you stubborn snow trudger, you quorum of eight who jostle one another for a strip of plastic on the last endless day, the last endless night of our only sun's solar winds, those glorious auroras, glassing gowns of Blake's angels, that almost invisible shine tugged and stretched between you like taffy from outer space, tattered ends gripped in your fur-crusted beaks as we reel headlong into the dwindling unknown, denizens of the frozen north, the last frontier, harbingers of unluck and the cold, bleak lack to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorian. That was amazing. And thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Safia. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Hala. This has been such a wonderful reading. And thank you, Layla, for bringing this beautiful lineup together. Um, thank you to all who tuned in today. This past October marked the Rails 20th anniversary and we'll be celebrating throughout 2021. Please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent like this radical poetry reading series, the NSE and Are We the Immigrants Project. Every amount matters to us. Our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors. And you can all check out the chat for more information or ask one of our team. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a Common Ground, a new history of museums. Entrepreneur Yoram Roth and architect Mitchell Joachim will join rail editor at large Paul D. Miller for a conversation on the unexpected intersections of art and tech and reimagining the future of museums, which will conclude Include with a reading by writer Alyssa Court. And you now can all turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Emily. Thank you, Sophia. Thank, Thank you, Hala. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sophia, thank you so much. Thank you, Leila. You know, major nurturing reading. We feel super alive. Yes. <laughs>